Our top story now, and after four days of hard negotiations, the Congress will announce Sita Ramaya as Chief Minister and D.K. Shiv Kumar as his deputy at the Congress Legislative Party meeting in Bengaluru this evening. Uh, so finally, this tussle that we've all been reporting for the last four days has been resolved. Absolutely, Gargi. Uh, since, uh, you know, that uh, result that came out on Saturday, it's taken days uh, for that decision to be made. And that oath-taking ceremony, which is supposed to take place, uh, will now be taking place on Saturday. Sita Ramaya will be elected as the Congress Legislative Party leader and cabinet formation discussions are almost complete according to sources, Kargi. That's right. And according to reports, Congress uh, President Malikarjun Kharge worked through the night to find this solution. And let's go across to uh, Sunil Prabhu uh, for more. And Sunil, uh, tell us more firstly about, how, you know, finally this issue is resolved. A huge sigh of relief uh, for the Congress and all you reporters who've been tracking this story for the last four days. Uh, but uh, Sonia Gandhi's intervention finally led to uh, D.K. Shiv Kumar accepting the proposal. That's uh, right. That's what we have been told that, uh, you know, he really softened his uh, position after... Uh, the intervention of uh, Sonia Gandhi. Sonia Gandhi really uh, making that uh, uh, plea to him, saying that uh, I am there, I will handle it. Of course, it all hinges on the Lok Sabha elections and how, uh, you know, uh, the performance takes place uh, in terms of uh, how they can go forward. Uh, the fine tuning uh, is uh, really being worked out about uh, power sharing uh, post, uh, you know, the uh, 2.5 years. Uh, those are certain fi final details. What we have been told is uh, two, three important points. One, that the Congress President, Mr. Karge, along with the Congress, uh, uh, former Congress President, Sonia Gandhi, really worked on Mr. D.K. Shivkumar uh, to find a resolution. It was with the intervention of Sonia Gandhi over telephone uh, that uh, he did uh, finally yield uh, and uh, softened his position and was assured uh, that she will take care of his uh, 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 position and his uh, uh, work that he has done. Uh, Mr. Sidharamaya was also explained uh, that he's been given because there's no other way uh, to accommodate him, uh, given the fact that he's also been a mass campaigner and has had the majority of MLAs in support of him. Uh, so it's in this backdrop that Mr. D.K. Shivkumar uh, finally conceded. Uh, the big issue is now uh, that uh, Mr. D.K. Shivkumar will continue as the PCC chief, uh, as well as, of course, uh, get some key portfolios. Uh, what we have been told is that those fine-tuning is still being worked out by Mr. Randeep, uh, Sujay Wala, the ACC General Secretary in charge, Mr. Venu Gopal, uh, as well as uh, other senior leaders uh, to accommodate uh, various other uh, segments. For example, they will have to ensure uh, that there is a proper uh, uh, representation of Lingayats, of the Dalits, both the left and the right, uh, of uh, the Muslims uh, who have voted uh, for the Congress this time. Uh, Mr. D.K. Shivkumar himself is a Vokiliga uh, and other uh, regions which have to be represented. Uh, so it's in this backdrop and of course uh, the Christians, this Mr. K.J. George is also a likelihood to become uh, the uh, uh, cabinet minister who has been now nine times elected. So uh, these are uh, certain details. The fine-tuning, uh, what we have been told uh, by uh, the top Congress sources uh, is still to be worked out. Uh, but uh, uh, the swearing-in, as, as, as you rightly said, will be on the 20th. All like-minded parties have been invited uh, and uh, they plan to have a grand show uh, to show opposition unity uh, on that uh, day. Right. Uh, so, Sunil, we don't know the exact details of the power sharing or the exact number of portfolios, but that announcement expected uh, this evening in Bengaluru and that swearing-in ceremony to take place on the weekend. That's right, Adivya. As we've been saying uh, consistently that uh, uh, the swearing-in and the announcement will be made in Bangalore, the Congress Legislative Party. Uh, the observers have been asked to take a flight uh, to uh, Bangalore uh, to uh, conduct the proceedings and then of course they will stake this cla their claim uh, to the governor uh, later uh, as soon as the CLP meeting is over uh, and uh, bring in the formalities uh, for uh, you know government formation uh, and as as we've been reporting the swearing in on the 20th uh, at 12:30 uh, uh, at the Kantiva Stadium. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Sunil, for joining us with all those details. So finally, the tussle uh, for C Chief Ministership there resolved. Well, moving on uh, to other news now. And the Quad Summit in Australia has been cancelled, but Prime Minister Modi's scheduled visit to the three nations does start uh, tomorrow, and that remains unchanged. Absolutely, Gargi. Including Australia and Japan, the Prime Minister it will be on a six-day visit uh, to uh, many nations in order to attend the three key multilateral summits, including that of Group of uh, 
7. That's the G7 and the Quad. Our colleague Mega gets us the details. Cancellation of Quad Summit in Australia has not changed Prime Minister Narendra Modi's scheduled visit to three nations starting 19th of this month. Prime Minister will be travelling to Hiroshima in Japan to attend the G7 summit on Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio's invite. Prime Minister is expected to hold several bilateral on the sidelines of the summit and also attend a meeting between all the Quad leaders over the weekend. Prime Minister Modi will be addressing the G7 gathering and is expected to speak on issues around peace, stability and climate change. From Japan, PM Modi will travel to Port Mosby in Papua New Guinea, becoming the first ever Indian Prime Minister to visit the island nation. Along with the host nation's Prime Minister, Mr. Modi will be inaugurating the third summit of the Forum of Indo-Pacific Island Cooperation, apart from holding a couple of bilaterals there. Finally, Prime Minister will be heading to Sydney, where he has several engagements. Prime Minister will be sitting down for a bilateral with Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. He will also be interacting with the top Australian CEOs and business leaders. A grand welcome and community reception has been planned by the Indian diaspora on 23rd of May, for which major preparations are already underway. Well, news now from Maharashtra and the BJP has begun its poll preparations in Maharashtra with J.P. Nadda's two-day visit there. Now, uh, even as Sena's Udhav Thakre and NCP's Sharad Pawar both called for a meeting of the parties uh, in order to discuss uh, their strategies, the uh, BJP begins the poll preparations in Maharashtra. After the Karnataka setback and two consecutive bipolar losses in Maharashtra, has the BJP decided to prepare for assembly elections in the state well in advance, or is this an indication that BMC polls are to be announced very soon? These are the questions that arise as BJP party president Mr. J.P. Nadda spends two days in Mumbai and Pune. Nadda's itinerary is packed with meetings on poll preparations. He will be sitting down with BJP MPs and MLAs along with a separate meeting with the cabinet ministers. In Pune, he will be addressing 1,200 newly appointed members of the Maharashtra Working Committee. The message is simple. BJP has to strive to win all 48 Lok Sabha seats in the state. There is speculation about BMC polls again, after Deputy Chief Minister Devendra Fadnavis predicted its possibility by October or November this year. On the other end of the political spectrum in the state, both NCP and Shiv Sena held their separate meetings and decided upon capitalizing on the recent observations made by the Supreme Court, which they claim is in their favor. Exact Nikal kya result kya laga hai wo janta ke taraf janta ke paas bhi pahunchna chahiye ye hetu se aaj meeting manya paksh pramukh uddhav ji thakre sahab ne li hai aur humne sab shivasainikon ne sankalp kiya hai jo sarvoch nyayalay ne jo nikal diya hai kyunki kuch log aise hai unke khilaf result laga to bhi pede kha rahe ho pede bhara rahe hai dhol daase baja rahe hai in the last one year a lot has changed in maharashtra politics and now each of these parties are making new strategies based on the new equation that has been formed. With Mega Prasad in Delhi and camera person Praveen Jirohit in Mumbai, Sohit Mishra, NDTV. India has pushed back against the generation by a top European Union official for a crackdown on Russian oil resold by Indian firms as refined fuels. With External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar in fact saying that such exports don't violate any EU regulations. Responding to Joseph Borrell, EU Foreign Policy Chief's remarks calling Jay Shankar advised him to look at the EU Council regulations. My understanding of uh, the Council regulations is that uh, if Russian crude is substantially transformed 
in a third country, then it's not treated as Russian anymore. I would urge you to look at Council Regulation 833-2014. External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar's stern response to the European Union for trying to tutor India on oil resale. This after the European Union's foreign policy chief urged the European Union to crack down on imports coming from India. While India's External Affairs Minister and the European Union's foreign policy chief met at the trade technology talks in Brussels, the European Union's Executive Vice President on competition had there said that there was no doubt about the legal basis of the sanctions and that the European Union and India would have the discussion as friends with an extended hand and of course not a pointed finger. I will not uh, add uh, to this. Um, there is, uh, I think, no doubt about the legal basis uh, of the sanctions. Uh, of course, it is uh, a discussion that we will have uh, with friends, uh, but it will be with an uh, uh, extended hand and, and, of course, not with a, a pointed finger. Interestingly, European oil majors have made record profits after the surge in energy prices ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. While the European Union's goal is to stop feeding Russia's war chest by banning Russian refined oil products in retaliation for the war in Ukraine, experts believe questions can't be raised on a third country such as India now, as if someone is selling oil, there's also a clear buyer for it. Earlier this month, Rajya Sabha MP Jawahar Sirkar, in a letter to External Affairs Minister, mentioned the report by Finland's think tank, the Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air, on two Gujarat refineries making huge profits from exporting Russian oil. India has called this report misleading and a deceptive effort to tarnish India's image. While tackling sanctions evasion is likely to be a key discussion topic at the G7 summit in Japan, it is important to remember the oil market dynamics have clearly changed ever since the Russia-Ukraine war. Sakshi Bajaj for NDTV. Imprisoned Pakistani origin Canadian businessman Tahawar Rana, who has uh, been wanted in India for several years for his involvement in the 2008 Mumbai terror attack, can now be extradited to India. U.S. court in California has ruled. Well, the judge uh, Jacqueline uh, Chuljin of uh, U.S. District Court in Central District of Los Angeles in the order has said that based on the foregoing, uh, the court concluded that the 62-year-old Rana is, uh, can be extradited uh, for the offences for which extradition has been requested and as to which, uh, on which uh, the United States is now proceeding. That's right. Let's go across to Nita now for more. And uh, Nita, this is some. It's a big, uh, you know, development for India, given that we've been wanting Tahawar Rana for so long, uh, considering his ma massive role that he played in the 2611 attacks. Absolutely, Gargi. It's a big victory for India. Uh, we have to remember that there is a, a treaty between India and United States of America and under that treaty, uh, the offences that uh, Tahavur Rana has been charged with is extraditable. So, the judge has clearly said that India had, uh, you know, uh, sent an arrest warrant there, NIA, the National Investigating Agency was pursuing the case and the charges that he has been framed for are quite serious. The charges that he has been framed for is waging war against India, conspiracy and also murder and committing terrorist act and conspiracy to commit terrorist act. So these are very heinous uh, charges. The judge obviously uh, held the ruling in India's favor. India is obviously excited about it because for last so many years they were trying to get Tahavur Rana. The trial of 2008 you know has almost come to a standstill because now India accuses both Pakistan also that uh, despite so many evidences given to Pakistan Pakistan has not been doing anything uh, as uh, against whom those are uh, uh, the mastermind who are still there in Pakistan as far as Tahavur Rana is concerned. He is considered a close associate of David Coleman Headley. In fact, it was uh, under his uh, his uh, uh, firm, a law firm under which uh, as a forged, uh, you know, as a forged front, uh, Headley was operating in Mumbai. So, uh, five American uh, nationals were also killed in that attack in which uh, we had seen 166 people uh, were killed by 10 terrorists who had infiltrated across to India. 
India on 26 November. So it it was a very dastardly uh, act. Now India is obviously elevated. However, the case is still going on against him in US also. So pending trial, he would be there, but he has to submit before the Indian uh, court system also. So the trial against Tahavur Rana could now start uh, as soon as possible. NIA is obviously elated about this development. Gargi. All right, so massive development there, and uh, India and NI, of course, elated, and finally, Atahar Rana can be brought to justice here in India. Well, with that, time for us to slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll get you a judgment that's coming up in the Supreme Court regarding the police challenging uh, the Tamil Nadu uh, government, allowing the traditional bull taming sport, Jali Kattu, back in a whole lot. Welcome back. The Supreme Court is scheduled to pronounce its judgment on a batch of pleas challenging Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra laws allowing the traditional bull taming sport, Jalikatu and Bullock uh, cart races and that judgment is coming up today. Right. Remember, it was a huge controversy in uh, Tamil Nadu when uh, at one point uh, the Supreme Court had ruled against it and now uh, taken back to the Supreme Court. Tamil Nadu had passed its own law allowing uh, Jalikat and many pleas against it for cruelty uh, to the animal. Now, it is a bull taming sport that is played as part of the Pongal Harvest Festival in Tamil Nadu. A five judge constitution bench headed by Justice K.M. Joseph will be pronouncing its verdict according to the cause list published in the Supreme Court's website, a single judgment will be pronounced by Justice Anirudha Bose. Now the petitions including one filed by animal rights body uh, uh, Peter have uh, challenged the state law that allowed the bull taming sport in Tamil Nadu. 